Well, hello. Welcome to A Moment with the Truth. My name is Scott Wood, and I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here at CV Church. I've entitled this devotional today, How Disobedience and Obedience Impact Our Daily Lives. Today's text is 1 Samuel chapter 15, 16, and it's been called by Dr. Youngblood as the literary, historical, and theological crux or centerpiece of the entire book of 1 Samuel. The reason is, is that chapters 15 and 16, we see the beginning of the demise of King Saul because of his disobedience. It is truly tragic to see him go from being filled with God's spirit and being led uh, as king by the Holy Spirit, successful in first, and then to witness how his disobedience, his arrogance, his fearfulness, and his impetuousness and rebellion removes him from being king. He still leads Israel for 42 years, but it's a miserable life that he endures and dies tragically. On the other hand, David, through his obedience, becomes anointed as king, and God places him in Saul's court, and he begins to be trained in the spiritual, relational, and political life of Israel, the nation that he is being raised up to lead. Let's look at Scripture. 1 Samuel 15, 3, God tells Samuel to instruct Saul to completely destroy the nation of Amalek because they opposed Israel when they came from Egypt. He was told to kill everything and everyone that belonged to them. This text and texts like this have created a lot of questions and animosity towards the God of the Bible. In his book, Is God a Moral Monster? Paul Copen indicates that the Amalek nation had been storing up their sins for years. God was judging them not only because of their idolatrous worship, but because of their outrageous moral acts. They were an incredibly wicked moral nation. And God knew that if Israel did not get rid of this nation, they would assimilate their idolatry and they would become an immoral people and nation. And God has told us clearly in the book of Leviticus that his reason for bringing Israel out of Egypt was that they would learn to worship him and they would become holy as he is holy. Now Saul again commits partial obedience, which is disobedience. In verses 7 and 8, the Bible states, Then Saul slaughtered the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur out of Egypt. He captured Agag, the Amalite king, but completely destroyed everyone else. Saul and his men spared Agag's life and kept the best of the sheep, the goats, the cattle, the fat calves, and the lambs, and everything, in fact, and this is important, that appealed to them. They destroyed only that what was worthless or poor quality. Poor quality. That's not what God told them to do. In verse 10 it says, Then the Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king. For he has not been loyal to me, and he has refused to obey my command. Samuel was so deeply moved when he heard this, he cried out to the Lord all night. After Samuel confronts Saul, and Saul gives him some lame excuses for his disobedience, Samuel's response is one of the most profound passages in what God thinks about our disobedience and obedience to his word, will, and way. Verse 20. But I did obey the Lord, Saul insisted. I carried out the mission he gave me. I brought back King Agag, but I destroyed everyone else. Then my troops, now he's blaming, brought in the best of the sheep, goats, cattle, and plunder to sacrifice to the Lord your God. That phrase Saul says three or four times, not our God, not my God, but your God, which shows that at his heart, he never really did submit his life to Yahweh. Verse 22, but Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft, meaning that that's what sources witchcraft and the occult and basic rebellion. 
It is a heart for Satan, not for God. And stubbornness is as bad as worshiping idols. So because you've rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Now, application. The application is quite clear to me. God chose Saul and then removed him because he rejected God's word to him. Disobedience, loved ones, is not something that God will tolerate in the long run. It really is a matter of the heart. It is about integrity, and it is about character. As you read through the story of Saul, he never really ever gets it right. At best, Saul offers partial obedience. God doesn't want part of our heart or partial obedience. Whatever he asks us and tells us to do something, he wants us to conduct ourselves spiritually, emotionally, relationally, vocationally, intellectually, and sexually. It's always for good reason. It's always for what is our best and what will bring him glory and honor. God is about seeing his holiness and wholeness reproduced in our lives. God isn't about how much we can sacrifice of our times and talent and treasure and tithe and touch. As much as he's looking for obedience to his word and his way, God is looking to see if our natural inclination is to obey or is it to resist, argue, rebel, and do our own thing. The results of Saul's disobedience was devastating. I'm always personally feel rebuked and corrected by the Holy Spirit when I insist on what I think is right in my own eyes, and I resist God's will and purposes for my own life. Saul only makes excuses, and then he tries to repent after Samuel says that God is done with him. Church, it's time, while we're going through this sheltering at home, to truly get honest with God about where are you, where am I, resisting and rebelling against God's way for us spiritually, emotionally, relationally, financially, vocationally, intellectually, physically, and sexually. I invite you to join me in a robust season of reflection, repentance, and renewal to commit ourselves to be obedient to God's commands and words for our lives so that we can live in the open windows of God's purposes for our lives and in an intimate relationship with him. Would you pray with me? Father, we're deeply moved today as we read about Saul. It, it has created a sadness in my own heart as I see him beginning to rebel, beginning to resist, beginning to lie in a position that God has given him over all of the nation of Israel. And Lord, we want to join today and, and repent Lord, we repent for our resistance. We repent for our stubbornness. We repent for doubting you. Lord, we repent when we argue and we gripe and we complain and we murmur and we pout and we withdraw from you. We withdraw from each other. We withdraw from the ministries that you have given us because our feelings get hurt and we want to do something different. Lord, I'm asking that you would not only forgive us but cleanse us. Remove these impurities from our hearts and our minds. Lord, may we have a heart that is fully devoted to you, where we respond out of openness and we quickly obey to your leadings and to what the principles that we read of truth in your word. Lord, I'm asking you that you come and do something of renewal and repentance that will create revival in our lives. We thank you for it. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. I look forward to spending a moment with the truth with you tomorrow. You might invite a friend to join you or give them a link that they can join us. God bless you.